but everybody's going to have about 10 minutes. We're not doing worship tonight. I'm just going to open up in prayer in a second, and then we're going to go through, and we're going to have about seven, 10-minute messages or so. So what I'd love for us to do is, uh, for some of them, it's their very first time preaching, so I'd love for us to just support the heck out of them, and let's just, let's just be on their side tonight, and you know, let's just build them up, because I, you know, anytime that, that you preach, the, the support of the crowd always helps you to do it even better. So uh, we're just going to support everybody who's preaching tonight. So what we're going to do is we're going to just open up in prayer, and then Senya is going to start it off. So let's go ahead and pray, and let's just ask the Spirit of God to do a work tonight. Lord, we love you. We're so grateful that every time we get together, you have something you want to accomplish. And tonight, Lord, we believe in the diversity that you've been speaking into people's hearts, Lord, that you've been giving a message that may have some unification across the board. But Lord, the individuals that you've been speaking to are going to have an individual message. And I pray that you would continue to speak tonight as every person preaches. Lord, I pray that the seed of the word of God would go forward and it would not return void, but instead it would produce much fruit for your kingdom and for the name of Jesus to be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. All right, you guys ready to hear from some great speakers? All right, y'all give it up for Senya Gask. All right, girl. So Sam and I have recently been watching this show. I'm sure you all know it. It's called Fixer Upper. Yeah, y'all know about that show yeah. with the Chip and Joanna Gaines. We've been recently watching it since, we've, since I've come back from the girls' trip. I'm not very familiar with like home decor or, or who they are and things like that. But since the trip, it's been like, okay, like these seem like pretty cool people, like awesome, famous people, have good hearts, hard workers. And so we started watching their show, Fixer Upper. And it's interesting with this show, they, they fix houses, but it's not just fixing any house. It's fixing dumps. It's fixing houses that are rat infested, they have mold and like stuff is like just falling apart and with their clients they're just the clients even in the early seasons in the first episodes the clients are just like mm, I'm not sure about this and then some people are just like well it is Chip and Joe so you never know you can't really trust them and it's like well from what I know about them it's like they these are the people that for one work hard visionaries and they get the job done and they just they just change everything and it's just this unconventional way of doing things. Like I know, for instance, Sam and I just moved into a house in the beginning of the year. It's about 60 years old. It was move-in ready. There are some little things that can be fixed, but it's not mandatory. It's not really necessary. And then you have Michael and Michelle who moved into a house that was built from the ground up. So they're the first ones to use that, or to live in that house. First ones to use the toilet, that particular toilet, which is important. And then rarely do you find people that want to fix a broken down house. Rarely do you want to find that. And then this show, this particular show has become so popular because it is possible. Even though it's a different way of doing things, it's an unconventional way of doing things, it's, it's possible. They get it done. And that's why Chip and Joanna Gaines are so famous and so popular. And people believe in them because they have such a good track record of just making this change in such an unconventional way, not because for the sake of being unconventional, but for the sake that this house can turn into something else. You can live in something that doesn't seem it's livable. And you actually see all, like, see this unconventional ways in scriptures. You see this all throughout the Bible, and you mainly see it with the stories of Jesus. So I want to talk about a particular story in the Bible. It's specifically in Mark 8, Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And I'm going I'm to describe the story. I don't have scriptures or anything. But in this particular story, Jesus is trying to get out of Galilee. And so he's going through this particular village or town called Bethsaida. And in this town, before previously in, in uh, different parts of the Bible, he's done miracles in this place, but people didn't believe it. They, they just disregarded it. They're just like, we don't care what you have to bring for us. So as he's trying to pass through this city to just get away, he actually gets stopped by a group of people. And these group of people are begging him to heal this particular blind man. Now, listen here. The friends begged Jesus to heal the blind man, not the blind man. So, knowing what we know and how we can relate to, to other stories that Jesus has done, 
Jesus does not heal him right away. He doesn't heal him there. What he does is he guides him out of the village, takes him away, and it's just him and the blind man. So what he does essentially is he removes this blind man from an unfamiliar place, an environment of unbelief. He removes him from that, takes him somewhere else. And so in that moment, he's with this blind man. It's just him and Jesus. And he spits in his face. <laughs> just right in his face. For one, for one, I have a few points for that. For one, that's not healthy. There are no healing compounds or healing components in saliva. There's just not. And depending on the severity of the blind man's eyes, that could cause infection. And then second of all, it's disgusting. And it's super degrading. When I was a kid, um, I spit in my sister's face. But I didn't just spit like I went, you know, just now. Like I spit just now. I did it in her face. And I got in so much trouble for it because it's wrong. You just don't do that. Now, if I were a kid and I've heard the story, as a kid, I would have been like, well, Jesus spit in a man's face too. Good thing I didn't know that at that time. <laughs> so he spits in his face. And the point is with this, Jesus is going to do some things that's going to shock you. He's going to shake you. It's going to be unconventional. He's not just going to go up to you and say, your faith has healed you. Because for one, the friends, remember the friends, they were the ones that begged Jesus. They were the ones that had the faith, not the blind man. Because if you read on in the story, he doesn't see clearly right away. What he says, he sees, he sees moving people and they look like trees. So they're not clear. So right there, he spits in the face. He does something unconventional to stir faith in us or to stir faith in him. And with that, it's to stir faith in us. So there may be some things that Jesus is going to do or that God's going to do, and it's going to seem weird, unconventional. And you're going to think, God, why are you doing it this way? And it's not because he's doing it to be different. He's doing it to stir something in us. So we have to trust in that because it's all for us to begin with. It's not to get from point A to point B for the blessing, for the miracle. It's for him to stir something in us because that's what's going to last long. The faith in us is what's going to last long. So with this blind man, he, Jesus touched him and he says, your faith has healed you. So he started believing. Once he started to see trees or what he thought were trees, he started to believe. And that's when Jesus touched him and said, your faith has healed you. Don't go back to the city because that's where the unbelief is. Don't go back. Keep moving forward. Go home a different way. All that to say, are you willing to trust Jesus? Are you willing to trust God in the unconven with the unconventional? Because with Chip and Joanna Gaines, I don't care what they bring. Like if, if I gave them money and said, hey, help me. And they showed me this dump, but they said, but we have vision here. Ship lap here, just a fresh coat of paint. The floors look great. I'd be like, I don't care. Do whatever you want. Because I trust you because you have a good track record. Jesus is the same thing. He's got a good track record. He's held me. He's done so many things in my life that have been so unconventional. But it's for a purpose because he's stirring faith in me. Because any doubt that I have, any circumstance that comes my way, I know someone that can fulfill that for me, that can, that can give me peace and that can give me the strength to keep going. Yeah. Amen, church? Yeah. Come on, man. Man, that was awesome. And we praise Jesus, of course, but come on, man. Y'all give it up for Sanya. That was great. Look at that. No notes. How do you do that? I can't even do that. That's amazing. All right. So, man, Senya knocked it out of the park. Here's what we're going to do now. Now we're going to go with a couple back-to-back. -back. So y'all give it up for Andy Bond as he brings a word. Come on, Andy. All right. All right. I'm very, very excited to speak. Um, I have been for about like two weeks. I wrote this. It was like super long, and now I've, I've trimmed it down, and I'm, I'm just excited to share. Um, so I don't know if any of you have a tattoo or what your opinion of tattoos are. I know, I think in the Christian world that can be very, you know, varied. And, I, and for me, w w Michelle bought me a tattoo for Christmas one year. <laughs> and I, and, and only because she knew that there was one thing, if I was like, you know what, there's one thing I want a tattoo, I think I know what it is. Because what's the one rule with a tattoo? It's 
make sure you're going to like it when you're older. Like, that's the rule with a tattoo. And so I was like, I'm not getting a ton of tattoos because I don't know if I'm going to like that dolphin. And, um, <laughs> and so for me, I got a lion on my chest, and I got the scripture, and it's Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all else, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. What I like about this scripture is it's, it's a priority. It's above everything else, the entire scripture, every commandment, the one thing you need to do is guard your heart. And a huge pet peeve for me is priorities, man. When I, when I hear people talk and they tell me about their dreams, they're like, man, I love travel. I just, I love travel. And then they eat out every day and they never travel. And I'm like, do you? <laughs> and and I, think, I think priorities can get out of whack if you don't guard them. You know, you have to protect the things that are important. So in Matthew 22, 36 through 37, the Pharisees say, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So above all, the thing we're supposed to guard is our love and our heart for God. That's the number one thing. And so for me, that was a tattoo worth getting. And the lion, the lion of Judah over my heart. And that it, it's, my heart is my family, my kids. But most of all, it's God and my passion for him. And so my first point really tonight is that God wants your heart first and not just your obedience. I think a lot of people mess that up. And honestly, that is the story of the entire Old Testament. That God set rules and laws for people for their benefit. But it wasn't the laws that were important. Israel constantly fell away because they didn't have a heart for God. They just tried living by the rules and then they just fell in love with other things. And they fell away and then they were redeemed and then God saved them and then they fell away again. And it happened again and again and again because they just never got it. And this happened all the way into Jesus' time with the Pharisees. The Pharisees never got it. They just kept adding rules and rules and putting people in what they thought was freedom but was just bondage. That Jesus wanted them to have a heart for him because it's not the rules that are the priority. It's not your obedience. That's not the number one. Of course God wants you to listen and follow him. And he's going to ask a lot of you. But first and foremost, it's Jesus himself that's the priority. When I dated Michelle, um, I don't know if any of you married people or if you're dating, if you experience this, but like I would work 14-hour days on film sets and then I'd get off and I'd have to be back in eight hours or six hours. And I'd drive an hour into Prairieville <laughs> to go see her for like 30 minutes. And then I'd drive an hour back and be low on sleep, but I, it didn't, I didn't care. I did that like every night. For a long time, we got married a year after meeting. Like there was, there was something about a passion, a heart that I just loved her. And I wanted to see her all the time. And I think that's what God wants from us. Because he has that for us. Like he has a passion for you. And that's what he's asking for. And so I want to study in Matthew 19, 20 through 22. There's a story of a rich man who approaches Jesus. And here's what he has to say. He says, I have obeyed all the commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, well, if you want to be perfect, go ahead and sell all your possessions, give all your money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. I think when the man asked Jesus this, I think Jesus knew his heart. I think, I think Jesus knew that he was just trying to do the minimum. What do I have to do to get to heaven so I can move on to the next thing? Where's the heart? Like, can you imagine if I dated Michelle like that? It would be a broken and a fragile relationship. It wouldn't be strong. It wouldn't last. And so my next big point is that God's not a box to be checked. Man, he doesn't want the bare minimum. He wants your whole heart. You need to evaluate your heart on a regular basis. Scripture says to clothe yourself in humility on the morning and see, like, where's my heart? The, the works you do and the whole works versus grace debate of how we get saved is always flawed because you're always thinking, 
what's the angle? How do I get saved? And God's like, I, I just, I want a relationship with you. That should be your end goal. Like, do you want a relationship with me? And works are the thermometer. They're the fruit that comes out of a relationship with Jesus. They are not the thing that makes it. Like, Jesus wants a relationship with you. And he gives a pretty stern warning uh, later on in Matthew about knowing about God, but not actually knowing him. In, G- in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And I just think, do you know him? Like, do you know God? Like, are you in relationship with him? Are you just showing up on Sunday or going through the motions? Or is it this fragile relationship? And I'm not trying to, you know, bring it down or preach hellfire. I'm saying the opposite. It's, we call it a simple gospel when we sing that song because it's simple. Jesus wants you. Do you want him back? Jesus wants a relationship you with you. And the funny thing is, once God has your heart, you don't even have to think about salvation anymore. Like, it's not even a, you're like, what do you mean? Of course God's faithful. Like, look, you know who he is. You, you know his character, his faithfulness, how he's carried you thing after thing. He's going to be there for you. And those who are close to him, man, they know his voice. You just know him. And you would never question it. If you have a heart for God, everything else is just going to follow. It's, it's going to just be seamless. Um, and there's this one thought I had, and this is going to sound funny as I say it. You love the things your love loves. I'm going to say it again. You love the things your love loves. So Michelle really likes these movies um, that I'm not a huge fan of. Um, it's this person right here. <laughs> but I love her. And since she loves Medea, I do too. I'm willing to watch a Medea Boo Halloween too. <laughs> it's not my first choice, but I'll watch it. Um, and I love all kinds of things that she wouldn't... I, I love board games and Star Wars and Marvel movies and... She goes to those things with me. She loves, and I think that's where our Christianity comes from. It's that, well, who does, what does God love? God loves people. So, so do we. God loves the hurting, the broken, the oppressed. So, so do we. God loves, it says that he loves what is right and hates what is wrong. And so do we. Like, and at, out of our relationship that our, our Christianity, the thing we call that we're little Christs, we, we're like him. We're so close to him that we're like him and that people recognize us and they see Jesus in us. Every week, we always read this scripture. Every week. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That heart belief is so key. Because Jesus says, it says that every knee will bow and confess. Tongues will confess. It's the heart that's really the difference. And so when we're preaching the gospel, we want people to see the heart of God and give their heart to him, their lives to him, and it's out of that that fruit will grow. I'm never going to try to change someone when they come in the door. I'm going to try to get them to fall in love with Jesus, and that will change them. That's what changed me. That's probably what changed you. That's what God wanted from the beginning with Adam. That's what he wanted for us. He just wants to walk with us. And... Like I said earlier, the, the works first grace debate ends when you pursue God and you have a heart for him. Cool. That's it. Come on, man. That's a great word. Thank you, Andy. Man, it's such a powerful word. I'm loving this night already. All right. So next up is his wife who is, has already been in his message a little bit, but you know she's going to bring it tonight. So come on, man. Y'all give it up for Michelle Bond. Come on, girl. Thank you. Um, 
So as Pastor Josh mentioned at the beginning, uh, there was an intensive that we all went to for a few weeks to kind of just um, learn some tips on how to preach and speak and share the gospel. And um, on the third week, we knew that we would be speaking to some capacity, um, testing out our skills. And uh, while Josh is teaching, I just kind of felt like something stirred in my heart. And so I'm like, okay, let me write this down, you know, jot it, maybe I'll have it for later. Well, then Josh tells us what the topics are going to be that we're speaking on, and the first one's grace. And I'm like, oh, that's totally what I feel like just stirred my heart. So I was like, I'll take that one. And so then it's my turn. It's a few minutes go by, and um, I get a scripture, and I speak. And honestly, I couldn't have told you everything that I said because it just kind of flowed. And it was totally Jesus. I even went back and listened to myself on the podcast because I'm like, what did I say? And um, I was like, that's pretty good. Um, But... I just, it was a moment that was just simply for my teaching, and I feel like God used it in such a way. Like, maybe someone needed to hear that that night. Maybe someone who's going to listen to that podcast needs to hear that word, and I just felt like God spoke to me that I don't waste a moment, and how cool is that, that we have an opportunity to live a life never wasted, that in every season we can do something that brings God glory. I think sometimes we can go through seasons that are hard, and you can ask God why, that this seems pointless. There's nothing going right in my life right now. This is hard. No one likes me. This is a lonely season. God, what's the point? And so I think a great example of this in scripture is the story of Joseph. Um, I know most of us here know his story. He was a dreamer. He was loved by his father. He had the coat of many colors that made his brothers jealous. Um, And then at the age of 17, he began to have dreams. And he shared these dreams with his family. The first one, he had a dream that he was gathering wheat with his brothers. And um, their bunches of grain, his rose up and theirs bowed down to him. And he shares this with them. And they're like, what do you mean? You think that we're going to bow down to you one day? And it says that they hated him all the more for his dreams. Then he has another dream. And he goes again to his brothers, but this time he speaks to his father as well. And he says, I had a dream, the sun, the moon, the stars, they all bowed down to me. And even his father scoffed at him. And he's like, you think me and your mother and your brothers are going to bow down to you? And he said, um, in the scripture, it's in uh, Genesis 37, it says, but while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. So my first, uh, I guess, just point to you is sometimes the seasons God's called you to, people might come against. God doesn't always promise us um, that this life is going to be easy. Actually, we're told when we live a life for him that there's going to be persecution. There's going to be people that look at the things that God's called you to, and they're going to think it's crazy or radical or stupid and be like, why would you give up everything for that? Why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. I know for me, some people going back to school at 30 with little kids and trying to like go through nursing school seems crazy. But I know long ago that God planted it in my heart and I am determined to see that dream fulfilled. But I also love how it says, but the father wondered what the dreams meant. Even though he scolded him and scoffed him, he still wondered, but what if? Whenever someone tells you they don't believe in your season, they're still watching. They want to see if you're going to fulfill and stand and do what God's called you to do. So whenever you feel that people are rejecting you, tell them, bring it. Because now you have a moment to show God's glory in that season of your life. So let's go on with his story. So next, we know that Joseph is betrayed, thrown in a pit, enslaved, prison. And next thing you know, finally, at the age of 30, he's brought before Pharaoh. So this is 13 years later from when he had these dreams till he's finally seeing some relief in his life. And he interprets a dream for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, okay, you've told me my dream, that there's going to be seven years of plenty, seven years of uh, drought. Um, I want you in charge to help make sure that we save enough grain for those years of drought. So now a boy who was a shepherd is now made governor of all the land. It's amazing how when we are faithful to God, he restores everything that we've lost, plus. There's always more blessing to come than what we lost. And we also have to remember that it's not God making us lose these things. There's an enemy who wants to destroy your dreams. He wants to take your value from you. But if we can keep God at the center, 
there's so much glory to be seen. So now we have our season with Joseph where they go through the seven years of plenty and they've stored up their grain. And then two years in to the drought, who does he see but his brothers? So in Genesis 42, it says, now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. His first dream was finally brought to fruition at 39. He had this dream at 17. Don't let time steal your truth. Sometimes we are given something at a young age and we can be like, God, where is this? I've been seeking this out. And I think of so many stories in the Bible with Abraham. um, Oh my goodness, who was it with Rachel and Sarah um, or Rachel and Leah? He had to work and Jacob. Okay, thank you. But um, just so many times where people had a dream that they felt like God gave them, and it took a long time for it to come to fruition. And then finally we see in Genesis 45, um, Joseph did not make himself known to his brothers at first. Um, And we know he kind of put him through the ringer, but, you know, I get it. They put him through a lot. Um, But finally he has pity on them, and he says, And now do not be distressed. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. I love that. But God... He sent him before to save them a piece of the land, to preserve their lives. Sometimes you're going through a hard season where there's drought in your life, where it feels dry and dead, but you have to push through because there's someone on the other side of that that needs you to bring them to their promised land. They need what you have so that they can persevere. So I don't know what season you're in, but know that God always keeps his promise, all of it. So if you're in the pit, if you're feeling enslaved to anxiety, stress, chaotic life, whatever it is, if you're feeling um, maybe now that you're in the palace, Joseph still had to work in the palace. There's still work to be done in those seasons of plenty. We have to store up. We have to pursue Christ. We have to fill our lives so that when the droughts come, we have something to pour from. So I just want to encourage you with this final scripture. It's James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Whatever season you're in, I would encourage you, instead of asking why, asking God what. What can I learn in this season? Because if you learn the lesson now, You don't have to repeat it later, and you can help someone else walk through it. So I hope tonight that whatever your season you're in, you can begin to see that it's truly a blessing and that God can use it in every moment. Man, that's so good. Don't stop dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. That's powerful. All right, next up is going to be Mike Henderson. Love brother Mike. Mike's, Mike's been uh, hosting for a little while, and I, I just want to set the stage just for a little bit. I've been pushing him for at least a year now. When are you going to preach? When are you going to preach? When you gonna, he's like, I don't know, man. I don't know. So I've been putting a lot of pressure on him, but uh, I, I know he's got, he's got something inside of him that needs to come out, man. Man of wisdom. So why don't y'all give it up for Mike Henderson as he comes to bring a word. Hey, guys. All right. Um, I have been in the IT field for almost 20 years now, and it's uh, been all at Entrogy. And in that time that I've been there, well, I I will say this before you come ask me later. I cannot help you get your uh, power on sooner. I can't do it. Uh, My mom still doesn't get it. I just just call the 1-800 number just like she does, too, so I don't know. But uh, in my 20 years, I've realized that one of the biggest things in the IT field is reducing downtime. Downtime is when systems aren't working, the network, the internet's not working, or applications are not working. And these are big deals for uh, a lot of companies, small and, uh, and large companies. Uh, if you even think about uh, McDonald's, 
if McDonald's has an issue with their network or with their uh, computers, they will not sell you a hamburger. No one knows how to count money there. They can't, they can't do anything with it. It's just it's a dumb terminal, you know? <laughs> but uh, uh, the biggest focus is in the IT is to reduce downtime. So there's actually a process, and it's called uh, change management. And change management is uh, to help prevent unexpected downtime and manage risks and the impact of upgrades and maintenance, due to upgrades and maintenance. So basically, there's always things going on in the IT field where we need to upgrade a system. Something's getting old, we need to change this out. But the way that we do it has to be carefully planned out. So uh, for instance, I have a big change uh, this weekend, but I have to put in a plan, an action plan, of step by step what I'm gonna do. I have to get approval from the customers on the day and the time that I'm gonna do it. I have to let them know the outage time when they won't have access to their systems. I have to get a peer checker to check everything that I'm gonna do during that change to make sure that I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. A um, Couple other things, uh, I have to get a technical approver. That's an expert that has to check everything that I put down on in the plan to say that, okay, this is okay. So after I've done all that, I have to go on a conference call uh, with a, what's called a change board. And basically I have to defend my plan and say, guys, this is what I'm gonna do. This is gonna be the expected outcome of this plan. And they check to make sure I've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. And uh, once that's all done, then I get my approval. Now there's different levels. You have a minor change, you have standard changes, and then major changes. And based on the level and the impact of those changes, it determines uh, how, how big or how much the scrutiny uh, they put on my plan. So. The thing is, I think about it, I put all this work in to plan to make sure that everything goes well and to reduce the impact on the customers. But I wondered about my life, and you know, you may wonder about your life as well. You know, why if I'm doing this much planning for, you know, my job, why don't we put that much input and time uh, and focus on the plans and the decisions that we make uh, every day? You know, small things uh, all the way to big things, you know. Uh, it may be as small as uh, you know buying a car, you know uh, buying a house, or getting married, you know, or even small things. Where do my kids going to go to school? Things like that. But uh, I think some of the reasons we don't do that is because uh, we follow our appetites at times. You know, we do what feels good and uh, what looks good. Another thing is uh, we follow others. It works for them; they're doing it. So I think I'm going to do that as well. And uh, another thing is uh, fears. You know, we're reactionary. We just do it because we're scared. You know, you just don't want to get behind or, you know, you just don't want to have something, the bottom to fall out on you. And i uh, give you a quick story. Hopefully it's quick anyway. But uh, uh, several years ago, uh, I'm talking with my dad. My dad's like, hey, hey uh, you need to get some whole life insurance. I was like, okay, really? I need some whole life insurance. A couple days later, it just so happened, I run into one of my friends, and he sells insurance. And he's like, man, you need to get some whole life insurance. So I was like, man, you know, I started worrying and fearful, like, well, you know, I do have insurance through my job, but I was like, well, maybe if I lose my job or if I, I'm laid off, in between that time before I get another job, uh, I won't have any insurance, and, you know, my family won't have anything. So basically, I stretched myself Stretched my family, said, man, I'm going to get some whole life insurance. So it was about $250 a month for $200,000 worth of insurance. And I basically, you know, the family, we were starving for two years, <laughs> you know, because I made this decision out of fear, you know. So during that time, God allowed me to uh, feel the, the pressure of just, you know, if something happened, we had to go on the credit card, you know. But after those two years, or during those two years, I started uh, doing some things that helped me get to a point where I realized it's got to be a better way. It's got to be a better way. So when I went through those things, uh, I just said I had to swallow my pride, had to get rid of the whole life insurance, got some uh, term life insurance that freed up my life. I was able to breathe. And as a result, I was able to pay off all my bills get out of the debt, except for uh, the house. And as well, at one point, I had about $26,000 in the bank. Big difference. 
Because at first, I was doing what I thought was the best thing to do. I was following other people. I was fearful. But I just want to give you all four practical things. We all know them, but we don't always do them. Four practical things. So the first thing would be uh, prayer. Talk and listen to God. Have a conversation with God. And uh, tell him what you need. You know, and, you know, we have to remember sometimes that uh, it's not always us talking and telling God, you know, our problems, what we need. But we also have to listen during that time as well. And uh, Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So he's there for us. He knows what we need. He wants us to voice out what, what, what our needs are. And then we have to listen to him. We have to be expecting that he's going to tell us the things that we need to do. I did not do that when I was buying whole life insurance. <laughs> I was fearful. Uh, the next thing would be uh, read the word. Yeah. And uh, I had a, uh, uh, at a previous church, the pastor used to say, you got to get rid of the stinking thinking. Yeah. And the thing is, with reading the word, uh, uh, Josh brought it up a few weeks ago, but having that filter, you know, the, if you're sitting in front of the TV all the time watching the news, if you listen to certain things and you don't have that filter, uh, you're going to be swayed by everything that comes your way. You know, the range of emotions. If you're on Facebook, you know, you know, you up and down, you know, you could be moved to tears at one point and then you're angry at the next. But the thing is, reading the word provides a foundation. You know, it gives you balance in your life. So when those things are coming at you, you can uh, kind of look around those things. And Romans 12 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. His good, pleasing and perfect will. But don't be transformed by this world, the things that you see, the things that you hear. Get into the word. I did not do that. I did not do that during that time I was paying whole life insurance. <laughs> the next thing is uh, listening to the Holy Spirit. And uh, we have a quiet voice that's inside of us. John 14, 17 says he, he is the Holy Spirit. Oh, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives in you now and later will be in you. And this was Jesus saying this. He left so that the Holy Spirit could come and he is inside of us and we have to listen to that quiet voice. And I'll say, guys, uh, you know, you, uh, I'll say that... Uh, you know, sometimes uh, for me, I get those what I call a stop sign. And it, all, it may not always be like, go here and do this or whatever, but it could be like, don't go there. And I can tell you that when I was, before I got that whole life insurance, I got one of those stop signs. Like, ah, you know, but I was fearful, so I was like, ah. But you have to listen to that, that small voice that you have inside of you. The next thing, seek godly counsel and accountability. Accountability. We all need someone, maybe two or three people in our lives that will speak truth into our lives, godly truth into our lives. We need somebody that's going to gonna check us when we get out of line. And it is so, so, so very important. Um, for husbands, I encourage you, if your wife feels like, hey, we don't need to do that, listen. Listen to her. You know, she's the, the weaker vessel but I think she's more sensitive, you know, and we're always running, you know, trying to get things accomplished. But uh, God's given your wife as a helpmate for you to be able to speak into your life. So listen, uh, Proverbs 12, 15 says the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Let's be wise and listen, you know, be open to uh, criticism, be open to uh, people in your life telling you when you're out of line, you know. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer 
three or even better for a triple braided cord it's not easily broken we need each other you know and we have our small groups our anchor groups you know or you may have a close friend you know a spouse but you need people around you that are going to speak truth into your lives and love on you and care for you and they'll be watching out for you because everybody's got blind spots they're just things that we don't see and they'll be able to let you know that something's coming you need to watch out for this so these are those four things that i did not do when i was paying whole life insurance <laughs> For two years, that's about $6,000 that I was throwing away, and I was starving in the meantime. <laughs> but if I had did these four things, you know, I would have been able to have the, the wisdom, the protection, and the guidance that God has given us through those four things. You know, he's given us people around us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us his word, and he's given us the ability to pray to him and reach out to him and tell him what we need. So let's remember that. Amen. Come on, man. Man, are you grateful for the handles you just got? Something practical you can make something with right now? Gosh, I'm so grateful for that. Thank you for your wisdom, Mike. All right, next up, we got Brother Brandon Creighton in the house. Come on, man. The booming voice. Come on, man. All right, Brandon, let's see it. All right, so... Picture this, a funeral is taking place and people are mingling and talking and, uh, and uh, all of a sudden out of the blue, some old haggard guy walks in and, uh, and people get real quiet and they watch as he slowly kind of approaches the body. And at that point, somebody nudges somebody and they walk over and they put a piece of bread on the body and they put a bowl of beer on the body and, uh, and this guy comes up and he proceeds to eat the bread and he drinks the beer and everybody just slowly watching this and just kind of seeing what's going on and not really understanding fully and then somebody comes over hands the guy a few bucks and he leaves this is a common um tradition in the western world it's a pagan tradition called uh, the, sin, the Sin Eater, all right? It's a, uh, basically, this guy's responsibility was to make sure that the spirit didn't wander around, haunt the family, haunt the world, or whatever, and such. And in academic circles, Jesus himself has been basically personified as a sin eater, like um, not in a good way, right? He is basically, this tradition has been wrapped up in him to... Uh, in the Christian circles to basically explain away this thought process that we need somebody to make sure that we get to the next world at all. And so um, the, the, uh, the enemy likes to pervert things, right? And uh, he likes to pervert our thoughts and our minds about stuff. And the sin, sin eater thing is one that like, I think that he's perverted by using this pagan tradition and then trying to wrap it up in Jesus and rob us of something that we're supposed to do at all. And so um, in John 14, 12, and 13, it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Now, I've heard this people uh, say, you know, quote this scripture about doing greater things at all. Uh, and, uh, and it's always confused people. It's always wrapped people up, kind of like, what does that mean, greater things? I mean, he's Jesus. How can we do greater things than him? And, uh, um, but I think people kind of take this out of context a little bit, and they also kind of get a little selfish with it at times, uh, thinking that, like, oh, I want to be greater than Jesus, right? I want to sit there and, like, raise people. I want to walk on water, you know? And it's like, I'm going to walk on water. And he's like, well, okay, no, not, I don't think it's going to work too well for you, right? And such, and so, uh, but I like to look at this um, in, a, in a different context. One, this is the night before Jesus is going. To, this is literally like probably hours before he's been going to be arrested when he's when he preaches when he's you know, like not preaches, but he's sharing this with his disciples. And uh, and so, you know, when you know that you're about to die, <laughs> the last thing you start sharing is probably pretty important stuff, right? 
right before this is where he washes the disciples' feet, you know? That's a pretty important time, right? But loud and the last things he shares with them. But then this next chapter is where he shares this. And it can't, of course, the disciples are like, what are you talking about? And, uh, and they're really confused and, uh, and everything. But what I like to, what I kind of noticed in reading this today was that, like, he's not dead yet when he's preaching this. He hasn't died yet, and he hasn't forgiven anybody since. He hasn't ate anybody's sin, right? He hasn't taken the sin on himself yet at all. And so there was something in that that I was like really resonate with me when I noticed that. And I think what he's saying here in a different context of them just being the miracles is that like you will do even uh, greater works because I'm going to go be with the Father. He's saying what it, that he is going to sit there. He knows what he's about to do. And I think that there's something inside of us that we are supposed to take people's sin on ourselves as well. And uh, now, don't jump off the boat yet. All right, follow me here, okay? And uh, that there's some things that we're supposed to own. Jesus owns something that, we, that uh, wasn't his. And I think that there's a, there's a, there's a big thing in the, in the Christian faith that we have lost, that, that doesn't get taught, that doesn't, that doesn't get shared, that we're supposed to do the same. That was the greatest miracle he ever pulled off, right? The greatest miracle Jesus ever did was to forgive us of sins, to take the sins, all the sins of the world on himself, and, um, and forgive everybody. And, um, and one of the things that wraps people up is unforgiveness. That's like the biggest thing that keeps people from God. Is unforgiveness and bitterness and hate in our heart, right? And um, and so, um, a lot of people, uh, when they talk about greater, when they read this verse, they talk about volume, like we're supposed to do more than what he did. But I really think it's actually we need to get in line with what he did, the ultimate thing. And um, um, God gave us the gift of salvation, but he also gives us another gift. A little, long, little ways long, down the, down the uh, chapter in John 14, 27 says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is the gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And when people walk in unforgiveness and bitterness and hatred, right, their heart is troubled. Right, they're living fear that someone else is going to hurt them, and someone else is going to break them, and someone else is going to attack them. Right, and they keep other people arms linked, and especially Christ. Right, that um, um, unforgiveness leads to a lack of peace and a troubled heart, and uh, even physically. Right, according to Mayo Clinic, forgiveness brings with it when you actually forgive somebody. It forget, brings with it plenty of health benefits, including improve relationships. How about that? Right? Um, <laughs> crazy, right? Um, decreased anxiety and stress. Wow. It actually lowers blood pressure. And a lowered risk of depression. A stronger immune and, uh, system and heart health. Letting go of negative emotions can often have a remarkable impact on the body. Right? So where does that leave us? Okay, what are we supposed to do with this now? In 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, it says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, be patient with difficult people, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts, and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Right, and so when I was uh, when I was roughly sixteen, um, like well, one I grew up in a really abusive home. Some of y'all know this, and uh, and my father was a really really bad dude, and wasn't great. And um, um, when my mom got pregnant with me, my father uh, threw my mom to the ground, kicked her in her stomach repeatedly, trying to abort me, and um, and it just kind of got worse from there. Um, so started off really great and just went better, and uh. And so, uh, so I had a lot of hate in my heart for my dad. I had a lot of unforgiveness in my heart for my dad. And there was this, uh, this my, our pastor's brother, who's kind of like our associate pastor of a church we grew up in. His name was Brother Gene. Uh, one night, we're having a connect group, home group, whatever. And, uh, and he said, you hate your dad, son. And I said, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, duh. And uh, and so uh, he sat me down, and he said, uh, he said, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pretend to be your dad right now. And uh, so when you look at me, this and I, what I'm saying is coming from your dad, not from me. And I was like, okay. And he sat there and proceeded to say, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me for all the pain, all the hurt, all the stuff I've done to your mom, all the stuff that you've done, I've done to, you know, the family, to you, everything. And, uh, and with tears in my eyes, I just began to weep. And I said, I forgive you. And, uh, and something broke off of me in that, right? And, uh, and, uh, and Brother Gene, he, he owned my dad's sin. He took my dad's sin on himself. He stood in the gap and said the thing that I needed to hear, right? And what we have to understand is that the hand that hurts is the only hand that can heal, but rarely will the hurt allow that hand near them again, all right? And so sometimes for that person to find freedom, to find healing, we have to become that hand that hurt, right? But they'll let us near because we weren't the one that actually hurt them, right? And so we, need, we have to be willing to, to be the sin eater, right? We have to be willing to step into that position, step in that gap, right? Because ultimately people are what matter, right? People need to get close to Jesus at all. And they can't when they're holding on all this stuff, right? And um, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Right? What greater love can we show someone than owning something that isn't ours? Right? The Good Samaritan shows us that, right? We get that we, Jesus is kind of laying this stuff out for us if we really look, right? The, the, the parable of the, great, the Good Samaritan does that for us. The, the Samaritan owned it, right? He owned that guy's stuff. He owned his problems. He owned his things. He literally paid for it, right? And got, and got, him, to, got him to health when no one else would, right? It wasn't his responsibility, right? Jesus owned our sin, so let us strive to own, each, to own other people's sin, right? Let us strive to help people find, unfor- uh, find forgiveness from unforgiveness and, uh, that the enemy wants to entrap us in. Man. Uh, such a powerful message of forgiveness. Thank you, Brandon. Man, that's good. All right, so up next we have Hannah Amar, who whenever she... <laughs> now let's surprise her. Whenever she signed up for this, she put a little girl emoji doing like this. She's like, I don't know. Oh, we know, girl. We believe in you. So come on. Bring it, Hannah. Okay, so everybody always says, be careful what you ask for because you just might get it, right? Well, around this time last year, I was asking God to just teach me about his peace and his patience and Sure enough, now I work with two-year-olds, so um, I'm definitely learning his piece because I have 11 of them, and if you have any young kids, imagine 11 of them in the corner, um, 10 of them's crying because you haven't played Baby Shark eight times today, you only played it seven, and then the other one's in the corner crying because he just threw up and peed on himself at the same time. So I'm learning his piece in the aspect of whenever everything is going super crazy and like there's destruction and there's chaos. And then also there are times that God will teach you his peace whenever he gives you a promise and he's asking you to wait. And he's asking you to be content where you are until you see that promise come into fruition. So we're gonna be talking about the latter. And in the second instance of his peace, A lot of times the enemy will come at you in that time of waiting and try to tell you and distract you and dishearten you. And he'll let you know like, oh, it's not really happening right now. So it's never going to happen. And he just feeds you lies. 
Well, the opposite of doubt is faith, and where there's faith, there's peace. So I was looking this up, and in the Bible, um, in like the King James Version, he talks about peace 429 times. So that's a lot of times. That's like the equivalent, like my mom will tell me to go to the grocery store and she'll tell me, Hannah, get milk and eggs. And she'll tell me like a million times. She'll text me, she'll send me pictures because she knows I'm gonna forget. That's what God's doing with us. Okay. Okay, so there's a few points that I wanna share with y'all tonight. The first point is gonna be that God honors our foggy faithfulness. So the definition of foggy faithfulness in the Hannah Amar Dictionary, because I made this word up, is seeing and believing in the end game without knowing how you'll get there. So sometimes God asks us to walk in blind faith, and I'm still learning this, so I'm at no liberty to preach on this, but I have learned through lessons that he will also ask you to walk in foggy faith. And one really good example of this is in the story of Noah. And so I'm going to read it, and we're going to just go through the story together. Okay, so in Genesis 6, and we're going to start in verse 9, and then we're going to skip around a little bit. It says, this is the story of Noah. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah had no faults and was the only good man of his time. He lived in fellowship with God, but everyone else was evil in God's sight, and violence had spread everywhere. God looked at the world and saw that it was evil, for the people were all living evil lives. And God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to all people. I will destroy them completely because the world is full of their violent deeds. Sorry, I lost my place. Build a boat for yourself out of good timber and make rooms in it and cover it with tar inside and out. And then we're going to skip to verse 17. And he says, I'm going to send a flood on the earth to destroy every living being. Everything on earth will die, but I will make a covenant with you. Go into the boat with your wife, your sons, and their wives. Take into the boat with you a male and a female of every kind of animal and of every kind of bird in order to keep them alive. Take along all kinds of food for you and for them. Noah did everything that God commanded. So this is super powerful to me because Noah said yes, and he obeyed his small instructions, even though he did not know what it was like. He did not know the exact steps that he needed to take and how it would form to like God's promise being fulfilled, but he took his little steps. So I have a story. Um, me and like one of my best friends were like the same person, which is a blessing, but it's also a curse because we're both very forgetful. So one night I was over at her house really late and she wears glasses and she put them down and I didn't pay attention to where she put them down. And apparently neither, neither did she, because the next morning I get a call at like 6am and she's FaceTiming me to help her find her glasses in her room. <laughs> and so she's panning the room. She's like, Hannah, I can't see. She's blind as a bat. So... <laughs> I'm looking, I'm looking, and I see them. So I have to give her instructions on how to get to her glasses. So I'm like, okay, Maddie, take two steps forward. Okay, go to the right a little bit and walk till I tell you to stop. Okay, stop, and bend down and reach around, and she got them. She got them. But to me, that's kind of how God is with us, too, because he doesn't tell us, like, we can't see exactly what he sees. We're the blind ones. But he's telling us where to go, and he's giving us the little instructions and little steps to get us there. However, if Maddie would have not trusted me, and she would have been like, oh, I know my room better than you do, and she would have turned left instead of right, it would have taken so much longer for her to get her glasses. And I think that's what happens to us sometimes, is we think that we can do it, and we think that we know us better than God knows us. And so we take a little detour, but it takes us so much longer to get to the promise. And it isn't that God doesn't want to fulfill that promise. It's just that we were disobedient. Okay. (laughs) Now, (laughs) the next point is... (laughs) What we want is not always what we need. So we were called to peace. And in Colossians 3.15, it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since all members of the body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. So you were called to peace. The enemy is going to try anything in his power to attack that peace because it is a promise from God. And the enemy will attack it because he wants to dis... Um, he wants to it, like invalidate what God's word is. And he wants us to think that what he says is not true. So if you're feeling attacked by anxiety or if you're feeling attacked by doubt 
or what you want to happen isn't what's happening and it's taking longer, then that just means that you have an insane call of God on your life and the enemy feels threatened because what he, he does not attack anything that he doesn't feel threatened by. And so God promises in the Bible to fulfill his promises and not ours. In Philippians 1, 6, he says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He says that he who began the good work, not the work that you created in yourself, it's the work that he created through you. So whatever he puts in your heart, he will bring to fruition. It doesn't mean that your plans, even though they might seem good, it can be masked as a distraction by the devil. That's another one of his tactics. Okay, the other point is that God's promise requires sacrifice. And we're going to look in Genesis 7, the next verse, and verses 6 through 24. So just bear with me. It's a little bit. Okay, it says, Noah was 600 years old. Okay, remember 600. When the flood came on the earth, he and his wife and his sons and their wives went into the boat to escape the flood. A male and a female of every kind of animal and bird, whether ritually clean or unclean, went into the boat with Noah as God has commanded. Seven days later, the flood came. When Noah was 600 years old on the 17th day of the second month, all the outlets of the vast body of water beneath the earth burst open. All the floodgates of the sky were open and the rain fell on the earth for 40 days and nights. On the same day, Noah and his wife went into the boat with their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. With them went every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, and every kind of bird. A male and a female of each kind of living being went into the boat, went to the boat with Noah. As God has commanded, then the Lord shut the door behind Noah. Okay, this is where it gets kind of crazy. So the flood continued for 40 days, and the water became deep enough for the boat to float. The water became deeper, and the boat drifted on the surface. It became so deep that it covered the highest mountains, and it went on rising until it was about 25 feet above the top of the mountains. Every living being on earth died. Every bird, every animal, and every person, everything on earth that breathed died. The Lord destroyed all living things because all living beings, the earth, human beings, animals and birds, not only ones, the only ones that were left were Noah and those who were with him in the boat. And the water did not start going down for 150 days. Okay, so for God to fulfill his promise, he had to sacrifice all of the bad. And even though he created it, that must have been heartbreaking for him to see what he created to be destroyed. But for his promise to be fulfilled, he had to sacrifice the old and move on with the new. Okay, now the last point is that God always makes good on his promises. And we're going to see this in Genesis 8. This is the end of the story. And we're going to start in verse 13. And it says, When Noah was 601 years old, on the first day of the first month, the water was gone. Noah removed the covering of the boat, looked around, and saw that the ground was getting dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. God said to Noah, go out of the boat with your wife, your sons, and their wives. Take all the birds and animals out with you so that they may reproduce and spread all over the earth. So Noah went out of the boat with his sons, his wife, and their wives, and all the animals and birds went out of the boat in groups of their own kind. So it took an entire year of Noah being in that ark, and he probably was so discouraged on some days, but it still came into fruition. God invented the promise, so why would he invent a concept that he had no intention or power on following through? Now, I'm going to just give a quick example. Um, I know that a lot of you know I have been dealing with a lot of health issues. Well, God has given me the promise that I will be healed, but right now is a waiting period because I'm not getting worse, but I'm not getting better either, and so Right now, I have to hold on firm to God's promise, and I have to see, even though I can't understand why any of it's happening, I don't understand what is going to help me to get to the end goal of healing, but all that I know is that God has always been faithful, and he always will be faithful, and he'll be be faithful until the end of the days, and y'all just hold on to that encouragement today, no matter what you're going on, going on in your life, and that's it. Come on. Amen. Thank you, Hannah. Did y'all know that was in that girl? Oh my gosh, come on now. All right, our last speaker for tonight is Brother Ben Ringett. 
I'm excited about the potential in this young man. Come on, Ben, man. We can't wait to hear what you got. All right. Well, hello? Okay. All right. So who has an overbearing mother? <laughs> Hope they're not here. Who, had, who is the overbearing mother? We ain't, we're not judging. We're not judging. All right. So my mom, my mom used to tell me, she said, did you pack enough for lunch? She said, did you pack your lunch? She said, yes, ma'am. I pack my lunch for work or whatever. And I would go and I would always get to work and open it up and there would always be an extra snack pack or an extra banana or something I didn't put in there. She always made a decision for me that was better for me than I knew better for myself. I would, I would be eating lunch and I'm like, she, she would get home she would did you get that extra snack in your, in your lunch bag? I'm like, yes, ma'am. Well, one day, we went, my dad loved to take us camping. So when we were younger, my dad took us, and she had to work, so she would meet us there the next day. Well, she said, did you bring enough blankets? And I said, yes, Mom, it's 80 degrees outside. We don't need any more blankets. When we get there, it's probably going to be 90. We're only going like 20 miles north. Like, it's nothing crazy. And so we get up to the camping ground, and it's 80 degrees. We're setting up camp. Mom had thrown in, we didn't see, Mom had thrown in, like four extra blankets. And that night it dropped to like 30 degrees. She saved our lives. And she doesn't let us forget it. Uh, we still go over there some days and go, hi mom, how you doing? And we, we're leaving and she's like, all right, love you. And she'll say something, she's like, remember to do this. And I'm like, mom, I got it. She goes, no, remember the camping trip? That was like eight years ago. Leave it alone. But she, she will persist and remind us that, remember that camp? It was like sitting in a family event or something. And she'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Tell them about the time y'all went camping. And I saved your lives. I was like, oh, yeah. She decided to do something that we, that we thought we didn't need. So the story I want to look at is in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew. And, and Jesus had just finished doing the miracle of feeding the 5,000. He was tired, and, I mean, he was full. It's probably Chick-fil-A. It's the Lord's food. And so he, he wanted to go by himself and up to pray. So he told his disciples, hey, jump in a boat, get in the lake, and go to the other side. I'll get an Uber and meet y'all over there later. So in, well, a storm had come, and... And the disciples were like freaking out. They, were, they lost control of the boat. And Jesus heard them crying out for help. So we pick up in 25. And it says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the water. You know, it casually just says that, just walking on the water. Like that's something that just everybody does, walks on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when he climbed into the boat, the wind had died down. Two perspectives from this story is the first one is the disciples in the boat. They are, they're the logical ones in the story, and they're like, okay, Jesus is walking towards us. We should just chill here, and he's going to get to us. We'll be, everything will be okay. He's, he did it before. He can do it again because the story of him stopping the storm when he was asleep. Well, Peter had the bright idea, and then, and then there's Peter's perspective. Peter had the bright idea to walk out on the water. Like, nobody asked him to get out of the boat. Jesus said, hey, I dare you. The disciples didn't say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you were doing what he was doing? No. Peter decided to make the decision on his own. Yeah. But there's two perspectives from the, from, from the disciples. Was doubt, was like, it's impossible to walk on the water. And from Peter's side, it was faith. I can walk on the water. Yeah. Faith is illogical sometimes. Faith doesn't make any sense sometimes. We are dependent on solid circumstances. We want everything laid out. We want all the cards laid out on the table. If whatever can go wrong, I got to know before I get into the situation. Whatever can, can, can uh, possibly mess up this situation, whatever can go good, I got to know everything. I got to know the good. I got to know the bad. I have to know every single thing before I step out of the boat. Peter didn't have to, Peter didn't need, need that. Peter had faith. 
three things from this story I pull. The first one is direction. Jesus is it. Jesus is trying to show his disciples that when you take a chance and you go towards Jesus, see, when he told them to get out of the boat, he said, he said, come to me. He didn't say, go over there. He said, walk and just go over there. No, he said, come to me. When you have, make a decision in your life, and it's got to be a God decision, the direction has to be Jesus. The direction has to be Jesus. If it's not, it's going to go south. You're going to start to sink. I mean, he did start to sink. But for a second there, he defied gravity and walked on water. Like we always, we always look at this story and we say, oh man, Peter didn't have enough faith. Sunk like a cork. Oh no, corks float actually. <laughs> he floated like a cork for a second, but he sunk like whatever sinks, a rock, sure. But, but we always forget the fact that maybe for like 20 seconds, wherever long it was, he actually walked on water. We try to do this to make YouTube videos you look it up, people like run really fast at the, at the pool and they just go down. Like there's, there's no hope. But like we always look at that and we say, Peter was so doubtful. He was so doubtful. And that's the second one, doubt. Jesus isn't afraid of it. Yeah. Jesus isn't afraid of your doubt. As much as you think that your doubt has a lot of power and a lot of concrete, yeah. Jesus is like, no, 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 just bring it to me. Bring me your doubt. Yeah. Because Peter did bring his doubt. When he did step out, first he had the faith, he had the direction, then he started to sink, had the doubt. And Jesus was right there to lift him up. So when you have doubt, it's okay. Jesus knows all about it. The third one is decision. Peter, like I said before, Peter made the decision to step out of the boat. Nobody asked him. Jesus was walking on the water, just walking towards the boat. I'm sure Jesus knew that Peter was going to step out of the boat, but... The point was, even if Peter didn't step out of the boat, Jesus was still going to walk towards him and get in the boat. But Peter knew something the other disciples didn't see. He knew that Jesus was outside the boat. A lot of times in our life, we live inside of a boat. And it's okay. Like, it's fine. This is what the world says to do. This is what, put as much money in your bank account as you can. This is what the world tells you to do. Don't give anything away. Save everything you can. And these are... These aren't bad things. They're not. But is every decision in your life a concrete decision, a boat that you're living in, the right decision all the time? Or is it sometimes you need to step out where Jesus is? Because we all, we all want to say, Jesus, call, if you call me, I'll go. If you, if you call me, I'll go. Well, he calls you, and then you go, no, it's not looking right now at the finances. You know, I could, I could, I could go talk to that person, but the game's on. I got to hurry. I got to hurry back home. I could, I could help that person change a tire on the side of the road, but I, I got to get to church. It's a good thing, but is it what God wants you to do right then and there? The boat was a good thing. The boat was a safe thing. The water wasn't safe. But Peter knew that this was going to be something to define his life. Peter knew this decision was something that was going to make a difference later. On the night of August 27, 1963, Martin Luther King, he was about to give a speech at the Lincoln Memorial, and he stayed up all night preparing, looking at his notes. So he was really tired when he got up there. He gave the speech, and in the middle of his speech, Malaya Jackson, Mahale, Mahale, Mahale Jackson, so to his side, he says, hey, Mark, Mark, tell him about that dream. He says, what? So he went off script, and the rest is history. He had a decision to, she had a decision to make, first of all, to tell him to be brave and to tell his dream. He had a decision to actually say it. If it wasn't for that, a lot of things wouldn't have changed in history. He was a, he was a, a paramount in this country in a lot of deciding factors in this country. And his decision to say, I have a dream, changed the course of his life. The decision for Peter to get out of the boat changed the course of his life, I believe. Because in Matthew 16, 18, Peter was called later the rock that Jesus would build his church on. And I think that one decision that one night was a big point, big big tipping point in Jesus deciding which disciple he was going to pick to build his church on. Because Jesus didn't call him, remember. 
He made a decision to take a step of faith and did something that was impossible. What boats in your life do you need to step out of? What boats are, are you in because it's safe? Like I said before, the point of the story was Jesus wasn't in the boat. He was, a, he was on the water. Later on, Peter makes a lot of mistakes, but Jesus still calls him. And then when, he, when Jesus dies and comes back, he tells, he tells the person, hey, run and go tell the disciples and Peter. I think that's very significant because he's, at that moment, he's showing Peter that he's forgiving him for denying him. And he's still saying that your promise is still true. And you're, you're still the disciple that I'm picking to build my church on. Peter stood out of the boat among the, uh, the other disciples, and Jesus stood him out in Scripture. So when you stand out, God sees that, and God will make you stand out. It's important. So that's what I have. What boats in your life do you need to step out of? What safety zones do you need to step out of? Like I said, things, things in this life are good. There are good things that are safe, saving money and making a smart decision not to go on a mission trip because of, of, of a smart reason. But when you truly feel a calling, when you truly feel something burning inside of you, step out, especially when no one else wants to. Because nobody followed Peter. Nobody said, oh, he's doing it. Let's all go. No, they were like, this guy's an idiot. He's going to drown. <laughs> like he's going to the bottom of this lake yeah. like that. But when, so when you step out of the boat, direction is the first thing. Go towards Jesus. Yeah. Doubt comes in the middle. That's the reason I have it in the middle of the points because it's going to come in the middle. You're going to see your direction. You're going to go towards it. You're going to have doubt yeah. almost all the time. Jesus isn't afraid of it. And then the decision before and after. That's it. That's good. Come on. Fantastic. Man, everybody. Wow, what a fantastic. Why don't you give, give it up for everybody who brought a word tonight? Not only was this a lot of fun, but man, what powerful messages. Don't you love seeing the diversity in the church of experience and like a life message and just what the Spirit of God is speaking? I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for all of you have done. Man, I see the future is bright. I'm excited about that. Hey, let me pray over you and then, um, and then we'll dismiss in a second. Uh, but all the speakers, I want to I wanna meet with you uh, for a second too. Lord, we thank you so much for this night. We thank you for your word. Thank you for every single person who was brave enough to step on the stage, preach your heart out, to study, to hear your voice. And Lord, I just pray that you would reward them, reward their families. Lord, bless them. And I pray that tonight would be a launching pad for their ministry. Lord, that you would continue to speak to them, that you would continue, that you would build their faith, that everything the enemy has lied to them about before this night would be completely demolished, that by your spirit, Lord, you would inject inside of them a confidence that could come from no one but you. And Lord, I pray that they would walk in bravery toward the calling and the gifting that you are placing in their lives. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for what this night is marking in every one of their lives. And we thank you that the word of God that was preached to all of us, Lord, we pray that we receive it. Lord, that you, you, that you would produce much fruit in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Yeah, baby. I don't know about y'all, but man, oh man, I'm just like my mind. I just, want, I, want to, I just want to say that as your pastors, there's anointing. There's a very powerful anointing on this house to, to raise up communicators and leaders I, I have been in church for a long time in, in different circles and circumstances, and there is something very special happening here. I just want you to know that. Um, and, and, man, Andy, what you said about guard your heart, that's what I want to tell you. Guard, guard the treasure and the investment that God has made in you. Guard it with everything you have because the enemy would want nothing more than to steal that, to rob that, to deter your your, the course of your life, but there is something very powerful that is going, going on here. And 
man, I just want to say, as I was sitting there, I was deeply ministered to by all of you guys. Deeply, I mean, the, every single one of you, the, the Holy Spirit was speaking something very profound to my heart. And thank you. Thank you for stepping out today. Thank you for being used by God. This is like, this is just the beginning. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Continue to step out. I mean, we're going to give you opportunity here. You know that. We're going to give you the opportunity. But continue to grow that thing in you. Allow the Spirit of God to cultivate that thing. Do the work. Study. Learn the scriptures because it's going to produce amazing fruit. So I love you guys. I just, it was, it was burning in my heart. I was like, what? What? What is going on here? Awesome. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, let's meet speakers. We'll meet right here, and I'll just go over a couple of things with you guys. Thank you all.